welcome to the Therapy Corner. Here at the Therapy Corner, we try to look at all things psychological in nature, both counseling, therapy, research. And what we try to do is enlighten, educate, and demystify. Try to help you all to really understand. Today, we have with us again, wonderful to have you back, Christina Thomason, who is a cancer survivor and a licensed clinical social worker. And so she has the unique ability to really address cancer from a firsthand perspective, not something that many clinicians have the ability to do. And so we're going to talk about the clinician's role in dealing with the cancer survivor. So welcome back, Christina. It's good to see you again. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mr. Oli, for having me back. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, on in our last segment, we talked from the patient and the family member's perspective of cancer. But this time around, I wanted to flip the coin and really look at what doctors, nurses, healthcare providers, as well as mental health therapists, what they should be looking at when they have a client who has cancer. Uh, so what, what, what should we be looking at? Well, first of all, I, I do want to mention that oftentimes when a patient is first diagnosed, the medical team's ammo is to get the disease in check. So they will throw that patient into surgeries, radiation, chemotherapy, all with the goal of attacking the disease and making sure that they are stable, which is absolutely their medical concern. However, on the flip side, I would argue that no one really talks about the emotional or psychological stresses that comes with having a cancer diagnosis. You know, no one really prepares you for the emotional toll of losing your hair, feeling fatigued all the time, um, all of that, as well as feeling depressed or anxious. So I would really want to advocate that for doctors, clinicians, nurse navigators, everyone who is working with a patient, that we should also integrate mental health care and that discussion early on. Yeah, I think, you know, on a, on a more minimal level, not mm -hmm. dealing with cancer, I, I've certainly had my, a slew of health issues. Uh, and it, it's sort of interesting, and in, I sort of grade doctors in terms of their bedside <laughs> manner. Yeah. And, you mm -hmm. know, being a nurse, I, I kind of, I, I deal with the clinical, no problem. I know what they're talking about. But, you know, I'm really kind of surprised sometimes uh, at doctors and their willingness to engage the client on something other than strictly clinical medical yep. issues. Yep. Yep. That is true. And I mean, again, I empathize with their perspective. They're there to treat the disease, but really I feel like the wave of cancer care is changing. It's so much more dynamic. Now patients are encouraged to speak up patients are encouraged to collaborate with their healthcare team. And research has really shown that when we establish a strong rapport with our patients, when we have their trust, when we treat them as people, as if they were our own friend or family member, that not only ups the patient's engagement, but I would also think that it helps them in the long run in terms of staying on track with their treatment, their quality of life, and just following through with all of the medical recommendations. So absolutely, Oli, what you said about having good bedside matters, just being a person really is so important in today's care. You know, as you were talking, I just remembered there was a piece of research that came out, I think it was about, I'm going to say about eight years ago, give or take a year, and it was directed at doctors because oh. what they were finding was that the outcome, physical outcome of the patient, you know, whether they were cured of their disease or whether they were, you know, some remedy was effective, was, in, was like a huge percentage was dependent upon how the doctor treated the person yeah. emotionally. Absolutely. And it really makes a difference. You know, it's important for patients to feel comfortable when they go to the hospital, when they go to the clinic for their checkups, because believe it or not, I mean, they are fighting for their lives every single day, no matter how well they look on the outside. So having a friendly smile, being personable, showing empathy towards patients 
really, really goes a long way. And I really do believe that the mind body relationship, when we feel cared for, when we feel respected by our healthcare providers, I really do think that that translate to, it translates to physical healing as well. Yeah, that's, that's what the research was pointing out. And it, it was mm-hmm. probably the first time that they had ever really nailed it, uh, mm-hmm. that the importance of mm-hmm. having that personal contact, because mm-hmm. the outcome of treatment, it, it showed what, what there was huge percentage. Uh, I'm not saying this well, but the, 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 there was a huge impact. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that kind of bridges into the next thing that I wanted to talk about is the importance of mental health care while mm-hmm. going through treatment. Thank I read an article that was published by the National Institutes of Health, NIH, and they did a research that found about 8 to 25% of newly diagnosed cancer patients met the diagnostic criteria for major depressive disorder, MDD. And when I thought eight to 25%, gosh, you know, I would even argue that it's probably higher because we're only going by what people are self-reporting. And oftentimes the topic of being depressed or being anxious or having a lot of these mental health concerns, it's not really discussed in the, in the arena of cancer care. And so for patients to even self-report those symptoms, I would, I would think it's a lot higher. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna interrupt mm-hmm. you for a minute because I'm inclined to agree with you because there, there's a similar thing that happened with postpartum depression. Mm-hmm. They, they thought it was you know, a small amount, like 5% actually. Right. There's always the baby blues, but they only thought that as far as real postpartum depression was 5%. They've had to completely redo that because they found it was much larger. Absolutely. So I'm not surprised at uh, what you're saying because, yeah, again, who who bothers to ask? Right. Because we're so focused on treating the physical disease that we hardly ask, sir, how are you feeling? Have you been feeling really down lately? How has your physical activities been? And I also want to piggyback that there's still a lot of stigma about mental health. You know, being a patient, I too have, uh, you know, I've hesitated in expressing, I've been feeling really down lately. And it really takes a skilled healthcare provider to discern what is the difference between symptoms of depression versus the side effects of some of the medications that this patient is taking. And that's very, very important is a lot of the cancer medications that patients have to take, it mimics symptoms of depression, fatigue, nausea, emotional instability, feeling tired, feeling helpless and hopeless. There are many overlaps with the side effects of medication. So I think one of the best ways to help discern the difference of major depressive disorder versus medication side effects is to really establish a baseline right from the get-go. When a patient is first diagnosed, I think it's really important to ask the patient and even the family members, what is this person's level of functioning? How are they? What's their level of activity? Are they, are they in any groups? Do they work? What's their activity level? What's their cognitive functioning level? And really understand that right from the get-go before you start giving them all of these medications that will inevitably change their mood and their mental mental functioning. So I think it's really important to establish a baseline right from the beginning. You know, you said something that is so important that just never, I hate to admit it, just never even occurred to me was that the medications that a cancer patient would be on might cause a depression. Yes. You know, yes. Uh, we all kind of think, oh, well, if you've got cancer, well, of course, you're going to be depressed. It's kind of like, oh, duh. But mm-hmm. we don't take into consideration the medications. And what occurs to me is, okay, what, like you said, the baseline before they got treatment, before they got diagnosed, were mm-hmm. they up and peppy and, you know, horseback mm-hmm. riding every day or what, mm-hmm. you know, but then one, it occurs to me, the cancer, the diagnosis alone, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm thinking for myself, would depress me horribly. 
Absolutely. And then if you give me medication on top of it, that's depressing. You've just exacerbated my condition. Absolutely. And, you know, for certain cancers, I'm thinking of breast cancer, for example, a very common treatment is to do some sort of hormone therapy. Well, guess what? If you are messing with someone's hormones, that will absolutely cause mood instability, changes in their personality. So it's very important to really discuss this with patients so that they know what to expect and that their loved ones can also keep an eye on them too. And so as a healthcare provider and as a therapist, when you have a, when you have a client who is going through cancer treatment, I think it's really important to check in with them regularly as regularly as you do their vital signs and their, their labs, right? You have to check in with their emotional well-being. Oli, how are you doing today? Yeah. What's something that you're looking forward to this weekend? Mm -hmm. Who helps you at home? Who's your support system? And really have those genuine conversations with people. And, you know, you don't have to do it in such a structured manner where it feels like an interrogation right? You don't have to sit there with an assessment screener. You just have normal conversations with them. And over time, you will get to know your patient and you will, and you will really get to know where they are mentally and emotionally. But, you know, I remember when they added that fifth vital sign, you know, mm -hmm. you used to have blood pressure and temperature and pulse and all that. They added pain. It seems mm. to me like with what you're saying, they need to add mental. Absolutely. Output. Yeah. And I know for hospitals, they'll utilize certain screeners like a PHQ-9, or they have actually a screener that is specific to cancer patients. It was developed by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN, and it kind of combines your traditional depressive screener but with this one, it also adds in some psychosocial questions, such as, do you have any problems with transportation? Are you stressed out about, about childcare? Do you need help with your household chores? And then it also asks about mood and eating, just things like that. And I think that that can also be integrated in kind of just your regular discussion if you feel like a patient is kind of going downhill with their mood. Wow. Yeah. As, as long as we're on this downhill path, let, let's take it to the ultimate mm -hmm. concern. Suicidality, that, that, it's always been a concern for mine. And but right. let's look at the cancer patient because that's your area of expertise here. Absolutely. And I definitely think that assessing for suicidality is often overlooked at especially when there are so many other quote, more important things to tend to like chemo or radiation. But we really have to understand that being diagnosed with cancer, going through all of the treatments, the doctor's appointments, all of the follow-up care, that is very much a traumatic event. And therefore we should treat it as an opportunity for patients and for clients to really be impacted by this trauma. One thing that I really want to encourage is again, going back to what we first discussed, establishing rapport with your patients, talking to them, having those sincere and open discussions. And it wouldn't even hurt to just be open, you know, and say, how are you feeling? Do you feel helpless? Do you feel like you're stuck? How is, who is helping you in your day-to-day -day activities? Because I think really in those conversations, this is where someone can really open up about what's going on with them. Thank you. That was a great way to do it. Uh, because um, a lot of people don't like talking about it, mm -hmm. or thinking about it. And that is the most dangerous. Most people don't realize that's mm -hmm. the most dangerous thing when they're not talking about it. Uh, the ones who talk about it openly, there's, there's a chance of them not doing it by just right. having a dialogue. And mm -hmm. as you pointed out, the medications could also cause depression. Well, mm -hmm. you know, we don't want the person killing themselves when there's a chance that they could survive the cancer. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. think you have to be direct, like you just suggested. It's thinking, it's not being done. No, uh, I really uh, don't think it's being discussed enough, really. Um, and I've spoken to other 
other friends of mine who are fellow cancer survivors, other patients that I've worked with in my practice who have gone through cancer treatment. And the resounding information that I'm getting from people is, yeah, at some point they've had really scary thoughts, really scary thoughts of just giving up taking matters into my own hands, as someone told me, you know, these are very scary things. And it's very, very concerning that no one is even asking patients about it. And patients are very reluctant to bring it up because it's very embarrassing. So we need to start normalizing these types of conversations so that when patients feel and experience scary thoughts, they feel comfortable speaking with their doctor, speaking with their nurse or any sort of healthcare provider. So if a doctor, God willing, Mm -hmm. is willing to open that door, Mm -hmm. can we get to a point, do you think, where we can get these people referred for uh, mental health work? where they can, you know, do some things with them, you know, any some sort of practitioner? Absolutely. And more often than not, they do have oncology social workers who specialize in doing more of the mental health side. So all the doctor or the nurse really needs to do is, hey, you know what? Thank you so much for sharing this with me. I really want to make sure that you're safe and I want to connect you with this person you know, they're going to help talk, talk you through it. And then from there, the oncology social worker can determine if a referral to a private clinician is needed, right, or any sort of extra care. But it's just so important to get them through the door and get that extra help so that they're not living with this, this just feeling of helplessness. And that's an ongoing Um, and they're not talking to anyone about it. I think it's just really important for doctors to screen it and then pass it on to the appropriate person. So do they have Mm -hmm. them at every cancer center? The ones I've been to and the ones I've um, referred clients to, then yes. It's becoming more of a regular thing, which I think is great because, you know, when we are dealing with the patient, the role of an oncology social worker is to look at the mental and the psychosocial aspects of the patient. Mm -hmm. Even, even practical things like, let's say it's an elderly patient, they live alone and they can't drive. This person needs transportation. And so that oncology social worker can connect them with a means of transportation, whether it's a shuttle, Uh. whether it's um, maybe a bus ticket, So that in itself will decrease the stress levels of that patient. Um, They can also run support groups and a lot of hospitals run cancer support groups, which are often led by therapists. So, you know, I think it's really important for any sort of healthcare team to work together, to collaborate and to know and understand that all of them play an equal role in helping this client be stable. Um, Many hospitals also have registered dietitians that talk about nutrition and eating and staying healthy during treatment. A lot of hospitals even offer um, physical therapists and other fitness instructors to get people moving. All of this is considered comprehensive healthcare. And I really think that's where the new wave of treatment is moving towards. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling really good about this part of our conversation because I was beginning to get a little concerned at the beginning, like we weren't addressing the issue at all. Right, uh, right. But, uh, you know, I, I think what's needing to take place, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think what's needing to take place is it has to get from the doctor talking to the patient and okay. then referring, the doctor referring, I think there's somebody you need to talk to, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I think that may be the missing link. Yeah, perhaps. Um, but equally, I think doctors and nurses have the capability to have those conversations with their patients. They're the ones who see them the most. And so it is important, I think, in medical school to integrate talking about crisis intervention, assessing for suicidality how to be empathic towards your patients. I really think that that is being integrated more now than it was 50 years ago. 
And it really is important because doctors and nurses, they see their patients the most during checkups and, and um, treatments. So they can have that conversation and if need be referred to a specialized person. So what, what, what should we as the mental health providers consider when we're dealing with cancer patients? Mm -hmm. So like we said earlier, we should first recognize that going through a cancer diagnosis, no matter what type or what stage, it is traumatic. And so therefore we should utilize the same skills that we would with you know, maybe someone going through a sexual assault or a natu natural disaster. So going it with that same framework, with that same empathy, I think would be very helpful. The second thing is recognizing that cancer has a ripple effect. It's going to impact the family dynamics. It's going to impact the relationships. People's roles are going to change. There's going to be certain strains in in certain relationships because now maybe one person needs to pick up the slack for the patient. And so having these conversations with your client who has been diagnosed with cancer, empathizing with them, validating just their family's experience could be very helpful. Yeah, it's funny, as you were talking, I was thinking of a client I had a number of years ago but it was sort of interesting what happened. At one point, we brought her husband in because she was feeling like he was just not being sympathetic enough. She had this attitude and it was like angry. And I thought, wow, you know, and then I brought him in and, you know, I found, and I don't know this is for everybody, but I found that she, as the patient who was dying, mm -hmm. it became all about her. Mm -hmm. She didn't realize that her partner was suffering along with her. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and so there was no empathy on her part for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I found that rather interesting. It was the first time I'd ever come across that. Uh, and since then, I've seen a few other instances of that where, you know, and, and it makes perfect sense. If you're the one dying, my God, it is all about you. I mean, you're right. trying to survive. Right. right. You know, right. and you want everybody to, to, to be, you know, on, on your team to help you. But we tend to forget those that are really, really close to us. They're hurting too. Absolutely. And that's why I think it's also equally important to tend to the spouses, to mm -hmm. tend to the children. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've worked with mothers who said, I don't know how to help my 10 year old tell them that I have cancer. Mm. How do I say this oh in, an, yeah. in, in a way that is honest, but also not scary? Yeah. And so it is important as the mental health provider to help coach your client and having these really difficult conversations with their loved ones. Um, and like what you did, Oli, is invite their loved one in for a session or two so that then, that way they can have the opportunity to share their experience, to grieve, to feel validated because they are equally hurting too. They are losing, they are at a loss themselves. Yeah, they're losing their partner, sometimes lifelong partner. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's devastating. And also, too, in, uh, in the aspect of mental health, I also think it's important that we should be assessing for other dual diagnoses that might be impacting the level of care. So one example is if, if a client has, has had ongoing substance abuse issues, this needs to be addressed. And... Oftentimes, doctors and nurses, they may not screen for this. I mean, obviously, with certain blood work, you might find out if a person is uh, abusing drugs or alcohol, but we really need to have these conversations straightforward because that could significantly impact um, their treatment. A lot of medications are not compatible with alcohol. Um, a lot of patients who continue to use during treatment decrease their their chances of survival so we need to also screen for substance abuse and any sort of co-occurring disorder that might impact patient engagement as well as them following through with treatment recommendations so yeah the impact of the use of alcohol but i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna flip this one on you because it's sort of interesting i had a client and at that time 
I mean, this lady, the last time I saw her, she had 30 years clean and sober. Wow. But here was the problem that I saw. She was reluctant to take pain medication. Ah, uh, uh, yes. And it's like, come on, girl, you know, <laughs> you're hurting. <laughs> is it is it because she was concerned it would cause her to relapse? Yeah, exactly. Okay. But that is a very real concern because that could essentially, you know, throw out their sobriety out the door. So again, what, what would you recommend, Oli? if you had a client who really, really needed pain medication because of their injuries, how do you think we could address that? Well, here again, if you work within the uh, 12 step program model, which Mm -hmm. I've become very familiar with over the years because of all the clients I've had uh, within the 12 step program, there's always the the recognition of for the potential for relapse, but as they have this wonderful attitude of you just get back on the wagon, Mm. So it's kind of like, all right, you may need this at this time. And yes, it could get you on the bad road, but you can get out of it again. And this is where Mm -hmm. attendance to NA or AA becomes so important that you maintain those connections and you maintain the relationship with your sponsor so they can help you work through that process. Don't be afraid to take the pain medication because Mm -hmm. you need that in order to keep your, I'm going to say mental, emotional and mm-hmm. physical state in a place where you can help fight the disease process. Uh, and don't worry about the after effects. You can always get back on the wagon. Another thing too, that comes to mind is what if we have a client who struggles with a personality disorder, for Ooh. example, Yeah. how might that complicate cancer treatment? How might that complicate their ability to follow through with what their doctor is telling them. Um, And so one of the things that comes to mind is with, with folks who might struggle with a personality disorder prior to their diagnosis, doctors could see some pushback, some resistance, um, you know, a lot of things that is built on trust it's not going to be as easy for them to build that trust. And so there is that extra layer of challenges when you have a person struggling with a personality disorder, plus they're diagnosed with cancer. And now they have to do all of these other things for their medical condition. That is why I am so glad that you have come to me to talk about this issue because we need to have mental health professionals mm-hmm. involved with the care, especially of cancer patients. Like you said, it be co-occurring disorders. They could have, you know, bipolar, they could mm-hmm. have personality disorders, they could have alcoholism, you know, right. they could have all kinds of disorders prior to their diagnosis, which will interfere with their, their treatment. Thank you for bringing that up because yeah, uh, I can see it with personality disorders, especially because of their underlying, you know, nobody loves me, nobody will love me. And I can't trust anybody because I know they don't love me, you know, and it's like, whoa, no, we're trying to save your life. Right, right, right. And so I would even advocate that mental health training with the cancer providers should be ongoing, and that these types of topics should be discussed, because guess what? Everyone can get diagnosed with cancer, and it is inevitable that you will have a cancer patient who has some sort of co-occurring disorder. I agree with you totally, wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I hate to bring it to a close because I've really enjoyed talking with you, Christina, but uh, this is a very important topic, and I hope this gets distributed out there to people who need to hear it, you know, like doctors, nurses, and other therapists. So let's keep our fingers crossed that the word gets out there. Fingers crossed. Okay, thank you. Okay, folks, that brings to close another episode of The Therapy Corner. Again, I hope you enjoyed our presentation and look forward to seeing you again next time.